Hi everyone, my name is Andrew Saunders. I'm with Patrick Wyko, Daniel Rinder, and Ryan Whelan, and we are students at Washington University in St. Louis. Today we will be, we will be presenting silk protein and some topics about it, including the structure, biomanufacturing, and applications. And no, it is not the silk protein on screen of silk milk. That is totally different. We are talking about spider silk and silk from silkworms. Okay, thank you. So first, I will talk about the structure of spider silk. Um, spider silk is comprised of two proteins, spidroin 1 and spidroin 2. And this figure is a schematic uh, representation of what these proteins look like. Um, there are common sequence motifs in, this, uh, in these proteins that uh, give rise to some of the properties of spider silk. So first, there are these alanine blocks, which contribute to the strength and uh, or the tensile strength and toughness of the silk fibers. And then there are these alternating glycine rich regions, which give rise to the elasticity of the fibers. Uh, these two images just depict uh, glycine and alanine, which are the two primary amino acids comprising uh, spidroin proteins. Uh, this table shows some of the mechanical properties of silk. Uh, from Bombyx mori, which is a, a species of silkworm, as well as different types of spider silk, and comparing that to different natural as well as artificial materials. Um, silk is one of the strongest materials found in nature. It's five times tougher than steel, three times tougher than Kevlar. Uh, it has a tensile strength that's similar to steel, despite having much lower density. So on a per unit mass basis, silk is a, a far stronger material than even steel. Um, silks possess uh, additional properties of biocompatibility and biodegradability. So taken together, these properties have all made silk an attractive option for use in novel biomedical applications. But while silkworm silk uh, can currently be produced via sericulture, um, spider silks are currently not commercially available uh, because spiders are difficult to domesticate and have lower yields. So these deficiencies have created a role for synthetic biology in the bioproduction of spider silk. Uh, some of the first successful attempts to express spider silk genes were reported in the late 1990s. Uh, for example, Prince and colleagues in 1995 and Fanestock and Irwin in 1997. Uh, these researchers expressed uh, synthetic spidroin proteins using E. coli host systems. Uh, so E. coli is a very well understood organism. Uh, it has a short doubling time and it's relatively cost effective. But one of the primary obstacles was that uh, because the, the gene sequences are so repetitive, this causes a lot of problems like genetic instability, as well as premature uh, termination of protein synthesis. So some of the strategies uh, that have been used um, include metabolic engineering and synthetic biology. So in 2010, um, Chia and colleagues were able to produce 285 kilodalton recombinant spidroin proteins. And this was the first instance of successfully producing native sized uh, silk proteins. So they did this by overexpressing the, the biosynthetic pathways for glycine as well as uh, glycyl tRNA molecules. So when spider silk proteins are being produced, there's a, a high demand for glycine amino acids. So by increasing the pool of available glycine molecules, as well as the corresponding tRNAs that bind them and attach them to the, the growing proteins, by increasing the, the pool uh, of available glycine and glycyl tRNA, they were able to help the cell meet the increased demand and were able to get a much higher expression and much higher molecular weight product. And then the second major breakthrough came in 2018, where Bowen and colleagues used a synthetic biology platform to produce recombinant spidroins of up to 556 kilodaltons, which was a previously unobtainable size. So they did this by combining the previous metabolic engineering methods with a method called split intian mediated ligation, which is basically where they were able to produce these smaller protein subunits and then splice them together using uh, these, these intian proteins. So uh, these intians catalyze the formation of a peptide bond, which allows them to produce much larger proteins from smaller subunits. 
Um, despite these improvements, there, the challenge remains of scaling up production to the industrial scale. So a, a study was conducted in 2017 to assess the economic feasibility of mass producing spider silk using industrial fermentations of E. coli. They modeled two different cases, a pioneer plant, which sort of represented the baseline, and then an optimized plant. So the pioneer plant, um, their models indicated a minimum sale price of $761 per kilogram. And as you can see from the figure, uh, the costs are dominated by materials uh, expenses, particularly in the fermentation and purification stages of production. So the authors then modeled a number of changes to the process. Um, and they were able to achieve a 97% reduction in minimum sale price using uh, different induction, different, uh, different growth medium, different purification methods, et cetera. So despite these improvements, they still found that materials accounted for 52%, over half of the total production cost. So this was less than in the baseline case, but still significant. And the authors improve, uh, concluded rather that further improvements would be needed to make fermentative production a, a commercially viable option. And I'll discuss uh, some of the strategies that are currently being pursued to meet these, these obstacles. So firstly, um, so one of the major obstacles was materials costs. For example, the carbon and nitrogen sources, as well as the growth medium. So, so one avenue that has been explored for reducing production costs is using different hosts that, that can grow on less expensive materials. So in 2020, Fung and colleagues produced recombinant spidroin, spidroin proteins using a new bacterium called Rhodobulum sulfidophilum. And this bacterium is really uh, a valuable option as a host system because it firstly contains photosynthesis and nitrogen fixation pathways, which allow it to grow using carbon, carbon dioxide gas and nitrogen gas as its carbon and nitrogen sources respectively. So these are both very cheap and abundant renewable resources. Um, secondly, it is able to grow in seawater, so a very uh, cheap and abundant growth medium. And this diagram just depicts uh, how they were able to uh, grow this bacteria, this recombinant bacteria to produce these proteins and uh, the nitrogen and, and carbon source, as well as the artificial seawater medium. Uh, the second, uh, or, or another um, promising uh, strategy has been secretion engineering, which would help to simplify the purification process by allowing the host to export the recombinant proteins outside the cell, which would eliminate uh, mo most of the, the purification steps. So, for example, in 2009, um, Widmeyer and colleagues were able to uh, demonstrate the use of a type 3 secretion system to export silk monomers. Um, so this just shows what the secretion system looks like. Um, there's this needle-like structure, which forms a channel that is used to uh, move the silk proteins outside the cell. So this is another promising uh, uh, method for helping to reduce cost and, and make spider silk production a commercially viable option. So now I'm going to talk about silk processing and artificial spinning. Okay. So it is very important to understand how silk is made in vivo, which means in the real life setting. For this purpose, we will focus on how spider silk is made in particular because the properties of spider silk have shown to be quite promising due to the very desirable qualities such as strength and adhesivity. Initially, the proteins such as fibrone or spidrone, which we'll touch on a bit more later, are in an aqueous solution in the spider silk sac. This is known as the dope. The storage of these proteins in the liquid medium will allow the spider to have one, two, three, maybe even eight different types of silk that can, they can spin with varying qualities for different activities. So rheology is the study of matter deformation in a flow, which has been a very important, uh, which is a very uh, important branch in physics used to understand the production of silk proteins in the liquid feedstock that is turned to a solid state. Understanding how these proteins can be transformed into the liquid mix or from the liquid mix to the small webs that you find on your porch or hiding in an old dusty corner can be the best understood by rheology. 
Studies in the 1960s determined that silk proteins could be aggregated into a solid silk by shearing at a very high rate. It was very difficult to confirm this observation due to the highly sensitive and handling limitations of silk processing. But later in the 1980s, studies confirmed the research regarding stress-induced phase transitions. So this polymerization activity is very similar to synthetic polymer melt, which is already very well understood by many scientists and in industry. Shear-induced polarized light imagery has allowed scientists to measure the shear rate and energy required for, to form silk structures in the early 2010s. This was very helpful because now we were able to tell what shear rate was necessary to actually produce cider silk, or spider silk, not in vivo. But practical difficulties have made spider silk less industrial viable in comparison to silkworms, which have been shown to be much easier to work with. Genetic engineering has also been shown to be a better alternative with DNA recombinants to produce spider silks from bacteria, plants, silkworms, and even goats. And so um, the, spider, the spider spinnerets, um, they will be located in the abdomen section below the spider. And there's typically one to eight different spinnerets, each with many microscopic spigots. And these spigots will determine the morphology in terms of what um what purpose the silk will serve such as for foraging for hunting for mating uh purposes or even for just nesting so with this research starting in the 1960s on how shearing could produce solid silk uh polymers from silk proteins scientists have found ways to replicate this in vivo process of silk uh spinning in spiders spiders are highly cannibalistic so it's very difficult to harvest the silk or silk proteins from spiders in which would be a typical farming practice. Compared to Bombyx mori, or commonly known as silkworms, which are used by humans for thousands of years and dating back to 2600 BCE by Emperor Lezu in ancient China, spiders are much harder to handle and are very cannibalistic. So scientists have now resorted to using silk and, from silkworms to emulate the even more desirable spider silk. So to do this process, silk from the silkworms can be solubilized in solution and artificially be spun to create spider-like silk. The process is still fairly new and very difficult because it requires a very specific rate of shearing and changes in pH that allow for the phase transition from liquid to solid state. When spun the silk sac, or when spun from a silk sac, the sac typically will be slightly basic and a little nearly neutral, so typically in a pH range of um, over 7.2 to 8, and um, and this uh, and this allows for the spiderons to be stored as a monomeric protein in the dope sac. The aggregation is further prevented by a change in different or a change a charge differential between positive and negative sides of the NT domain. As the proteins move closer to the spinning duct, the pH drops slightly below 6.5 and allows the NT terminals to form anti-parallel dimers. Uh, shear force in the spinning duct polymer, uh, shear force in spinning duct polymerize, um, or duct polymerize the silk with many pleated beta sheets, as Daniel touched on earlier. So scientists Jan Johansson and Anna Riesing, who were researchers at uh, Karolinska Institute in Sweden, were able to use E. coli to produce the protein and emulate the spinning process. They were do able to do this by creating a spinning device, which allowed for a sudden drop in pH from the spy um, pH in the spy droid, um, or sudden drop in pH, and the spy droid would be pumped through a glass capillary into a buffer solution. So this provided the shear stress and the pH drop that allowed for the separation of the monomeric protein and then the aggregation of it into the beta pleated sheets. And it's really important to have this pH, pH change or else you'll have um, the proteins will not come out right in terms of their, uh, they will not spin properly into their proper form and you'll have more globular shapes. Um, and so... Uh, these once you have the spin protein, you can form this into wire ropes, mats, films, or any other applications that Patrick will touch on in the next section. So I will be talking about the structure and applications of silk. So silk made is comprised of two main components: the fibrin and the sericin. The fibrin is the more structural. Um, component is the inside and it gives the cocoon its more characteristic shape and the outside is made of sericin which is the more softer more malleable uh, component and it has 
uh, much different, uh, much more different uh, properties than the interior of Firewin. So that structurally sound uh, characteristic that Firewin has can be actually used in wound healing um, for bones, tendons, areas of high stress. Um, on top of that, when it is adhered to the bones and whatnot, it actually promotes um, nutrigen, collagen, a lot of uh, pro-healing um, components to um, diffuse into the bone and accelerate healing. So a double, um, double uh, helping there. But once that's over, uh, the removal is much easier because it just dissolves into our body with no worry about being toxic or hindering us in any way. Bones can also be um, composed of hyrin and resemble the cornea structure in our eyes because of its uh, structural ability and non-toxicity. Hyrin is a perfect material that can keep that round shape in, um, in our eyes, but also not be rejected by the body and not be toxic to us and also allow for a new way of actually producing artificial corneas for us. The most common way of producing fibrin is to repeatedly freeze and thaw it, which will allow it to uh, become porous and strong. Uh, it's two most very important uh, characteristics to be used in the bone and cartilage. So sericin is the external um, component that I was talking about. Um, it isn't as strong as fibrin, but it does have properties such as antibacterial, antioxidant properties. Uh, it is UV resistant and is highly absorbent. Um, sericin has over 18 amino acids within it, making it highly polar. And sericin uh, molecules can vary from 10 to 300 kilodaltons. These low weight sericin peptides are used in cosmetics, healthcare products, and certain medications. Um, there's some research going on with drug delivery as microcapsules can be uh, much more less toxic um, using sericin. And the high weight sericin uh, polypeptides can be used in biodegradable materials, fabrics, and biomembranes to do them resembling the fibrin a bit better. Um, they can be interwoven with already existing polymers as polyester to improve its strength, blended with resins to make biodegradable polymers. Um, an example of that is biodeg biodegradable polyurethane. Uh, it has sericin segments interwoven within it, which allow uh, the polyurethane to be much more readily degraded. And finally, the applications. So as I mentioned previously, uh, tissue engineering and wound healing is really a, a big part of this uh, because of its sturdiness and um, its ability to be used at, to speed up the healing process. What is also interesting is that it can be used in cartilage. Cartilage is uh, a much more flexible um, bone using the mobility of our joints. And since silk is very frictionless, it can be used in there very um, readily to help with the wound healing in those areas as well. Uh, bioplastics. bioplastics can also be created from uh, silk when it's um, combined with chitosan coming from shrimp cells exoskeletons. Um, they can be uh, used to create very sturdy um, materials such as the screws on the right which are not only sturdy, but very biodegradable when used in nitrogen-rich media. The FDA has already approved um, applications such as these, um, such as implantable foam, film, scaffolding, tissue engineering, and other medical applications. And finally, sericin is very useful in preventing abrasive skin injuries and rashes. So an example of this is uh, uses in diapers to make sure that you no know, rashes would appear on a baby's body, um, and in very uh, plastic heavy environments such as workout equipment and rubber gloves to make them less abrasive on the skin. And now I will turn it over to my colleague Ryan to finish off with a summary and conclusion. Uh, thank you, Patrick. So I'm just here to bring all of this together and to look forward on the broader impact of the silk industry. So firstly, so some, just some strengths and weaknesses. Obviously, silk is an extremely strong material. However, it's also something produced naturally, which sets it apart from other things like Kevlar or steel. Furthermore, if you've ever felt silk, you know that it's almost frictionless and can be quite adhesive, lending itself to novel uses. Lastly, because it's a natural compound, it doesn't toxically degrade in the human body or have a negative impact on the environment, possibly leading to even broader scope of applications in the future. However, even though silk is a truly impressive substance, it's extremely hard to produce. Producing spider silk from recombinant E. coli is the cheapest known way, but even 
So one kilogram can cost upwards of thousands of dollars. Silkworm silk can be produced much cheaper, but the downside is that nowhere it has nowhere near the potential that spider silk has. In fact, the exact properties of spider silk have yet to be fully replicated in any capacity, which is why it's so sought after. Here's a graph of the projected growth of the silk industry. There's an increasing demand for silk as the silk market was expected to expand by 50% in five years. Silk has been used in cosmetics and textiles for years, but recent medical advancements meant that they, the medical industry is also looking into silk more. We expect that in the near future, demand will only continue to skyrocket as silk technology progresses. China has cornered the majority of the silk market as they produce 78% of the world's silk each year, which can be to some detriment of the global silk trade. Uh, and then this projected graph should be taken with a grain of salt as it was made before COVID and COVID did impact a large amount of the global silk production and trade. The ISU or International Silk Union has launched an investigation to assess the state of the market, but as of right now, they aren't entirely sure what the impact has been. As we've touched on, silk is being used for a wide variety of reasons, but we believe that the best is yet to come for the silk industry. It's been studied that spider webs have electrostatic properties to help them catch prey. We could theoretically use this mechanism as a, on a larger scale for biosensing or to capture fine particles in air or water. The medical applications for silk are also only just starting to be explored. As we've mentioned, silk membranes can be used for prosthetics or burn victims. Artificial cartilage can, be, can potentially be a safer and easier method of bone repair. And some studies have even done on the potential for nerve repair, but that's extremely preliminary. Additionally, fashion can always be improved. Newer types of fabric to resist tearing or weigh even less could be on the, on the horizon. But at the end of the day, these options for all of these fields could potentially explode as uses for silk are studied more intently. I hope you see why we think that silk is one of the most interesting materials and why silk production is, is an extremely underdeveloped field. There are countless applications for such a versatile material, and we hope that they're explored fully in years to come. Thank you.